Lords and heroes can be some of the most powerful things in the game if you use them correctly, whether it's on the battlefield or the campaign map. But unless you level them upright and choose the right skills, they'll never ascend to this godlike status and just stay as the relatively underwhelming single unit you recruited them as. Each character has a different skill tree that makes them good at particular things, and knowing which skills to pick up in what order can mean the difference between victory and defeat. This video is going to cover how to level up every single character in the game so you can go into your campaign and follow the right path to set yourself up to victory. So first up we should probably do the Lords since well they're here from the start and you know do all the leading. So when you're leveling any Lord there's a certain order of skills which take priority. This kind of makes it into a giant flowchart with a load of if statements deciding what you should do. <laughs> and I bet you thought this video would be boring. Anyway to start off with I like to have spells as a number one priority for nearly anyone that has them so our first question is this. Does your lord have spells? If yes, then level these first, since 9 out of 10 times they'll make the lord far better in combat both for manual battling and auto resolve. Not leveling up spells is like using a nuclear weapon to warm up your beans. Yes, the lord might do okay without them, but if you're going to split the atom, then the least you could do is crisp up your toast as well. Most of the time lords with spells are weak in combat, you know, for balance reasons. Going these spells first gets them to their full power much sooner and means they can actually contribute rather than standing at the back cheering on your army like a CEO. Once the spells are online, our next if statement is, does your lord have any unique lines? These are more common in legendary lords, but are worth checking for as some generic lords can also get them depending on what type of lord they are. Most of the time, these are worth getting as soon as possible since you can't really get these effects anywhere else. So if for nothing else, they're good for some novelty and variation. I'm not going to go through all the unique lines in the game since that'll take me all week, but most of the time you're going to be looking at buffs for specific units, the Lord themselves, or the faction on the whole. The Lord and faction buffs will always be great, but these specific units can sometimes be hit and miss. Like, there's not a lot of point massively upgrading zombies if I'm going to stop using them in like 15 turns. It's like sinking all of your money into an image token that's going to lose all value in a matter of months. Only a total moron would do such a thing. Our next if statement is perhaps the most iffy. The top row can be hit and miss between factions and even lords in those factions. Normally you have a mishmash of buffs to the lord, the army and more, so working out which ones are good can be a pain. You should really look at each skill and see if it will be useful for you, but for a quick bit of advice, do this. If the skill will benefit the army on the whole, then it's probably good. For example, leadership or buffs to the lord will benefit units they're close to, so this is a great choice. Resistance for just the Lord will only benefit them, so maybe don't go this unless they're taking too much damage in combat. So after you've got that out of the way, we can get back to the regular choices, and most of the time it's now going to go into this exact order. First up we have the blue line, or bottom row, or whatever you want to call it. Here we have a ton of buffs to the army on the campaign map. You can make the army move further, lower recruitment costs, upkeep costs, and the chance of being ambushed, and increase your replenishment rate, siege power, income, as well as much much more depending on your faction and lord. Lightning Strike is also normal in this tree, so if you're into the Fort Maggio, then go right ahead and pick that up. The reason we're going this next is that literally any army in the game will feel the benefit of the skills in this tree. Also, getting them online early gets the army performing better earlier and gets you ahead in the campaign with the ability to attack more often and make a whole lot more money while doing it. The other reason is, this allows your army to get better with more elite units, and the reason this is good is for the next tree we're going into. Next up, we have the red tree, and here we're going to spend a ton of points. The red tree holds buffs for pretty much every single unit in the faction's roster, so you might be thinking, just buff everything, right? Wrong. Not only would that be a literal truckload of points, you're also not going to use like 80% of the roster in most cases, so there's no point buffing units you'll never have in the army. Instead, you're going to buff units in your endgame army composition, even if you aren't in the endgame yet. And yes, this does mean you need to plan out your comp beforehand, but trust me, doing this will give you a huge power spike in the late game and make those top tier units even better, giving you an edge against an identical army that hasn't buffed them. It might be tempting to buff the units that you have now, but if you're not going to be using them in 10, 15 or even 20 turns, it's wasted points you'll never use again. Doing this ensures you get value out of those points into the end game and for the rest of your campaign. After all of your units are buffed, you're pretty much done with everything that needs to be leveled up. And now we can go into the optional skills. First up we have the yellow tree, which buffs lords in combat. You can go in here and make the lord better however you see fit. Most of the time you'll want to make the lord tougher and harder to take out to keep them alive and buffing your army for as long as possible. That being said, there are certain specific lords that can take on the one-man army build. Malice Darkblade is a great example of this since he is such a powerful battler by himself, 
and also has two HP bars for some reason. Yeah, I probably should have said this earlier, but there's a secret if statement after spells. If they can be a one-man army, then go straight into the yellow tree and buff them to high heaven with pretty much everything. This is a high-risk playstyle unless you have a super powerful lord, but if you get them fully online, they can literally fight the entire battle themselves without even needing an army, so giving them one alongside themselves is almost a joke. After you've done this, you can go right back to the normal build, but anything you see that buffs the lord themselves in combats, pick up as a priority before going back to anything else. Right, where were we? Oh yeah, so if you aren't doing this, then just make your lord better at what they're best at. If they're tanky, make them indestructible. If they have a powerful charging mount, make them an unstoppable force, etc, etc, etc. Some pure spellcaster lords don't even have this tree, which tells you just how useful it actually is. But if that's the case, then just skip past this onto the next part. Speaking of which, other than the yellow tree, you can pick up anything that's not needed, but nice to have, in the top row and blue line. For example, I don't usually go for reduced corruption, especially early on since it's not strictly needed, but it'll give you one less thing to worry about during late game invasions, so why not if you have the points to burn? Similarly, resistances and any buffs to the Lord themselves that are in the top row that you didn't get before, you can probably pick up now, since chances are they'll be on a mount, they'll be bigger, they'll need more defense, more buffs, yada yada yada, you've got points to burn, so you may as well use them. Other than that, Flawed, you don't really have anything else to worry about since mounts and immortality are automatic these days, so go out and enjoy your max rank god gamer of a lord. When it comes to heroes, they're a bit more diverse when it comes to how to build them, since most of them have totally different trees to each other, so we're going to split them up to make things simple. Assassin heroes are pretty much any hero that has access to the assassinate skill on the campaign map. While their exact stats and abilities may vary from faction to faction, normally they can be built pretty much the same, and that is one of two ways. Normally, I like to keep them on the campaign map since assassinating is so damn useful. In this case, you can upgrade assassinate and specialist skills, and then everything else on the blue line that helps them perform actions better. After this, you are pretty much done unless they have anything on the top row to upgrade their campaign performance. If you instead want to take them into battle, most of the time they'll make excellent duelists versus single targets, so basically assassins in the streets and in the sheets. If you're going this route, then you can ignore most of the bottom row since they'll get no value from their actions since, well, they won't be performing any of them. If they have something like training, then that's always a great pickup, but if not, straight to the yellow line for you. Since most of the time they don't have any other real skills, you can pretty much just grab everything here. Then the top row normally has more buffs to them in battle, so clearing anything useful up here is a good move, and you're basically doing the one-man army build from the Lords, but without anything else from the army. Aside from all these, you can grab anything like public order and corruption boosts when you're done, but that's about it. Next up, we have these spellcaster heroes, and this might be a head-ass take, and you can call me a bad player all you want, but for me, if a hero has spells at all, I want them to be my army, since otherwise you're leaving all that spell value on the table if they just sit on the campaign map the entire game. Most of the time, their hero actions aren't even that strong, so unless you have something game-changing like a Warlock Engineer, get them into your armies. Once they're in, you literally just want to go into their spells, and that's pretty much it. You may as well get every single spell and then come back to get them to the max rank, since most of the time there isn't a whole lot else to put points into. Once they're all done, you can look towards the top row to find any more buffs to the army first, and then the hero themselves. On the bottom row, normally they have something useful like replenishment, public order and corruption, so they're good to spend points in those towards the end. Next up we have the general fighter, and for some reason nearly every faction in the game has a hero that's like this. They aren't an amazing fighter, and they don't have the best skills on the campaign map, so they end up getting left in this state of limbo as to why you should ever use them and what you would exactly use them for. Because of this, working out how to level them, if you do end up having one, is a bit of a question mark too. Let's take the Empire Captain for example. On the campaign map, they have some okay skills, nothing too crazy, but fine. And in battle, it's pretty much the same story. They're not too bad, but they're all right. They have fine stats, but they aren't good enough for any one thing to warrant taking them over a spellcaster or an assassin. If you held a crossbow to my head and told me I had to use one, the best I could do is build a bit of a hybrid. Softening up enemy armies and garrisons is useful, so upgrade those skills, use them to perform these actions before putting them back in an army to finish the job. Since they're going to be battling, we're also going to go into the yellow line and buff them in combat focusing on tankiness, since that really is their best aspect. The top row has more upgrades for this sort of playstyle, so we can clear most of that out and grab training and spread control for passive gains. Now it's not perfect, but it's just about as much as you can get out of them. Like I said, I wouldn't really use them, but if I had to, this is what I would call the best skill build to get the most out of them. And finally, we have what I like to call the buff machine. I didn't really know what else to call these guys since that is really all they are. And if you're wondering what an example of this hero is, then think of something like the Gunnery White from the Vampire Coast or the Master Engineer from the Dwarves. These are both heroes that alone are pretty mid, but once you look at their skills and the buffs they can bring to their army, they become insanely powerful. They have a wide selection of skills that buff units in their army, so it goes without saying that getting them into one is priority number one. Their campaign skills are enough to put me to sleep, so there's literally no reason to have them anywhere else but the battlefield. Since they are buff machines, we're obviously going to focus on these kinds of skills when leveling them up. 
This can change from here to here in the different factions, but using the Master Engineer as our example, they have a whole tree that's pretty much just buffs to ranged units, so obviously, we want to go into that first. Pick up anything that helps units in the army, and you can't go wrong. Normally, this is enough to keep you busy for 15 levels or so, and once you're done, you can branch out into other areas. The top row, as usual, will have a mishmash, so just have a browse and prioritize anything that can help the army. The blue line can also have something useful like training or in this case increased mobility, so that's a good shout for closing out the helpful section of their skills. After this you can be a bit more selfish and upgrade the hero's own damage, and since in this case we're all about the ranged, it's going to be a bunch of ranged upgrades. I'd go for anything that gives them a longer range, since keeping them near your best performing ranged troops will get the most value, so having them also able to fire from pretty much anywhere just adds to that. And then anything else in the top row that's useful you can clear out before finishing with some blue, which in this case boosts income, so you can't go wrong there. And that is how to level any Lord or Hero in Total War Warhammer 3. Now there are very few exceptions to these rules, so as long as you follow these guidelines set out here, you should have characters performing pretty close to peak efficiency almost every time. I hope you enjoyed this video and or found it useful. If you did, consider leaving it like and subscribing to the channel. If you're feeling especially big penis and want to support the channel directly, you can do so by becoming a member on YouTube, a patron on the Patreon, or a subscriber on Twitch. Doing so gets you early insights into future content, increased voting power, discounts on merch, as well as shoutouts at the end of videos like Henry took of his spot at the officer's tier. Thank you to all supporters. One last thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Dunders, and I will see you next turn.